All right, good afternoon, everybody. This is uh, John Nearing, board chair of the Community Transit Board of Directors. So I wanna thank everybody for logging on to our July 2nd meeting of the Community Transit Board of Directors. As you know, if you're on this meeting, it's being held virtually uh, in accordance with the governor's stay home order, Proclamation 20-28. And I wanted to remind everybody that public comments were collected in writing and provided to the board in advance of the meeting today. So thank you to those who submitted comments for the record. Um, this meeting is being audio, audio recorded and for members of the public who wish to record this meeting themselves, you're welcome to do so. To record, please just click on the participants tab and click yes by your name. Um, a reminder to board members and presenters, if you could please keep your phone uh, and computer on mute unless you're speaking, that would be very helpful. And if you're joining by phone, just use star six to mute or unmute. And the slides referenced in this meeting can be found on the uh, website right next to the meeting agenda. And with that, would the clerk please do our roll call today? Thank you. Thank you. Council member Kim Daughtry. Present. Mayor Leonard Kelly. Here. Council member Tom Merrill is excused. Council member Mike Gallagher. Here filling in for our small cities. Council member Nate Nearing. Here. Council member John Nearing. Here. Lance Re Labor Representative Lance Norton. I'm here. Council member Jan Schwetti. Here. Mayor Nicola Smith. I see she's muted. She is here, I can see her. I, I see her there. Um, Council member Mike Todd. Here. Council member Stephanie Wright. Here. We board alternates, Council, Council member Laura Johnson. Council member Jared Reed, Mead. Council member Joe Marine. Council member James McNeil. Al Hendricks, our corporate attorney. I saw I saw Al here earlier. Our speakers, Emmett Heath. I'm here, thank you. Jerry Beardsley. I'm here, thank you. Presenters, Brian Valine. Here. Chris Beth. I'm here, thank you. I'm here. Chair, we have a quorum of board members. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, and this is Nicola. One. I got unmuted, so I'm here. <laughs> Thank you, Nicola. We are getting a little feedback from somebody, so if you could just uh, mute if you're not speaking. Um, Thank you very much. With that, we'll move on to um, uh, public comment, which we did mention we've accepted the written comments. And uh, for remote e meeting efficiency, we asked that anyone interested in providing such comments do so to the executive office, um, which uh, five, by 5 p.m. July 1st was for this week's meeting. So thank you for that, for those who provided that. And informational item, we'll start with uh, CEO Emmett Heath and his COVID-19 response update. Thank you, Mary Neary. Um, as we've done in previous meetings, I'll give you a COVID-19 update and then pause and do the rest of my CEO report uh, as a regular part of, part of the agenda. Uh, let me update you on ridership first. Um, our lowest ridership month in the pandemic was the third week of April. At that point, we had experienced a 68% overall decline in system-wide ridership and a 94% decline in commuter service. Uh, since then, and, and uh, more recently, we've seen a, a fairly slow and fairly steady return of ridership to the system. That's, uh, that's an encouraging outlook for the future. Um, with people returning to the system, though, it does present another challenge for us, and that is um, providing service where customers can maintain social distancing. 
as you know, we have uh, we put signs on about half the seats in the buses, closing them down in order to allow people to maintain social distance. But as ridership come back, comes back, and the load factors. Um, Juanita, are you able to mute everybody by chance? Okay, I think we're back on. Uh, so the, cha the challenge maintaining social distancing. Uh, we have some seats, seats have been closed down, but as more riders come back and the load factor on buses increases, it, it becomes increasingly challenging for people to voluntarily maintain that distance. One of the strategies we use in the system is to provide an empty bus that follows closely behind a trip where we think we are likely to experience a trip overload. Uh, we call those shadow buses, and so if the bus does get to a point where it experiences overloads, there's a, a an empty vehicle immediately behind it, <clears throat> so we can continue to pick up intending passengers. Our van pool system also experienced a significant decline in ridership. Uh, at the peak, uh, van pool usage was down about 80 percent from pre-COVID levels. We've had a uh, we have had over 400. Uh, 400 or there about van pools in operation. About 56 of those have uh, returned their vans. Um, 195 of those groups are on hold. That's a situation where we have allowed them to pay their base fare, but not any of the additional charges that accrue when they're actually uh, operating. That allows them to maintain their van and their van pool um, in, uh, in position to restart. Goodbye restart it quickly uh, when, uh, when they're ready to do so. A little bit of encouraging news about Vanpool, um, we've actually had seven new groups form in uh, just the past few days. So again, encouraging that people are starting to return to the system. Uh, next on our DART service, the Dial-A-Ride Transit service, uh, at the peak of the ridership decline, uh, DART services were down about 90%. Um, during the, uh, that low period in DART usage, uh, our, our users with disabilities were taking in the range of about 200 to 250 trips on DART per week. Uh, most recently, uh, we've had days over 900 and, and uh, I expect we'll be approaching 1,000 DART trips a day in the not too distant future. We, uh, regarding service levels, I've reported before, uh, not a lot of change, but I'll refresh. We reduced our service from pre-COVID levels to about 70% 70, 70 pre-COVID level. That's where we are today. I've reported uh, previously that we have furloughed employees that uh, mostly coach operators who uh, were not, who did not have work to perform at the 70% level. Next Monday, we will increase our service level to about 75%, and some of those sur uh, furloughed employees will return to work. And then September 20th of this year, we'll bump our service uh, level up to 85%, and even more of those furloughed employees will return to work. I have mentioned before that during the period while these employees are furloughed, they will uh, not be receiving direct wages, but the agency will be continuing to pay 95% of the cost of their uh, employer paid medical programs. Also notable that we were uh, able through voluntary furlough programs to avoid any involuntary furloughs uh, between the period from now until September of this year. The 85% uh, service level that we plan to operate beginning in September is one that is sustainable in the long term. Our intention is to continue to operate at that level at least through March of 2021 and uh, very possibly beyond that date. That level of service reduction, something uh, between in the range of 75 to 85 percent of pre-COVID levels, is pretty much what the rest of the transit agencies around the central Puget Sound are experiencing. I continue to meet uh, on a conference call with uh, all six Central Puget Sound transit agencies, plus several other transportation partners. Um, and uh, we all are pretty much grouped around that 
uh, 75 to 85 percent level today and going forward. Um, that is not all I have for you. I, I believe you're aware we began collecting fares on our system, uh, on our SWIFT network on June, June 1st. Uh, that fare restoration went as planned. Uh, yesterday on July 1st, we began collecting fare system-wide and uh, that went according to plan. At this point, we're feeling really confident that allowing passengers to start boarding through the front door again uh, can be done in a manner that keeps our coach operators um, very, very safe. We are providing personal protective equipment to our coach operators uh, on a regular basis. Um, we allow our coach operators to seek additional PPE if for any reason they feel they need more. The measures that we have put in place to protect the coach operators uh, meet and exceed the uh, requirements that are in place through the governor's face mask proclamation and the Department of Labor and Industry rules. And uh, I'm, I feel very confident that the measures we have in place um, allow boarding through the front door, collection of fares, and a very safe operation for our coach operators. We've mentioned before that we have uh, designed and installed and, and are testing some fixed barriers. Uh, that's a plexiglass barrier that uh, separates the coach operator from the front stairwell where passengers are boarding. Uh, several agencies in the region have elected to use those barriers. We are still testing. We're collecting uh, feedback from coach operators on a regular basis about how those test units are performing for them. And at this point, uh, the feedback that we have collected from coach operators is mixed. Some uh, preferring to have the barriers, uh, others not wanting to have the barriers. So I believe we're gonna need to continue to test, possibly even test some uh, different kinds of versions, but not go forward with uh, installation until we're very confident that installing those barriers would be as safe or safer than uh, procedures we already have in place. And that completes my report on the status of our COVID activities. Back to you, Chair Neri. Thank you uh, very much, appreciate your report. And we also are going to get a report now uh, on the financial um, part of the, of the agency from Director Beardsley. Go ahead, Jerry. Thank you, Mayor Neary. Um, I'm gonna start talking while Ula pulls up a couple of PowerPoints. This will be a short presentation today. I just have two slides and a couple of comments. So really today we're, we're just gonna focus on sales tax revenue. If you recall, <clears throat> each month we have been presenting you with information about how our sales tax revenue is looking compared to our budget, compared to the actuals in the prior year. Um, and, the, and the news is really good. Uh, in spending for both March and April, um, we saw higher spending than we had projected considering the stay home, stay healthy um, requirements. So what you have here is uh, sales tax by month in, uh, in the year of 2020. The top two lines that you can see all the way across the top are the budgeted for 2020 and the actual for 2019. And you can see they follow a similar cycle um, that's typical for us in, uh, in any given year, um, variations of months of spending. And remember, we're always talking about spending two months in advance of uh, the time we actually collect the revenue. What's happened is that um, the actuals were following pretty closely until March and April, where you can see the middle-ish of the graph, the dotted, where the line is dotted. Those are the actuals that we have seen in the last two months. So better than we had originally projected, but still down um, for the month of June, down 11%. If you recall, we were looking at two different scenarios. We continue to use them. One is the rapid recovery scenario. That's the yellow line you can see all the way across that graph in the middle. Slow recovery is the red line. Um, using these two scenarios, it's consistent with what our peer agencies are doing in the Puget Sound and around the state is to look at, you know, there are so many unknowns and so much uncertainty. What do we really think the sales tax revenue will do through the remainder of this year and then into, into the coming years. 
So our uh, kind of bookends, if you will, for the rapid and the slow recovery are at 13% and 22% uh, when averaged over the year. Um, really, I think the easiest way for me to describe this is that while the news has been good for the past two months, it's not been where we had budgeted or actual. It is still below those levels. Um, and with the number of unknowns, we really feel like it's just pushing that dip further out. Still don't know anything about depth and duration of a recession. Um, the regional and local impacts in this area with Boeing, for example. So we'll have, uh, you know, continue to do the monthly updates for you. But um, like I said, good news story, uh, really, compared to where we thought it could be uh, for the month, month of April. Ula, can you go to the next slide, please? So what we have here is looking out several years. Um, what you can see uh, in the year 2020 is that we had budgeted sales tax revenue to come in at 154 million for the year. Um, given our most recent updates for the June revenue, uh, our rapid and our slow recovery options, we would see either a decrease of 23 million or 36 million. The reason I'm focusing on uh, sales tax revenue, if you recall, is that it's about 72% of our revenue, total revenue for operating for, the, for this agency. So that's really the primary driver. There are some others, but this is really the one we wanted to focus on. Um, our, our hope is that we see revenue come in higher than even the rapid recovery. But as we do our planning for the rest of this year, 2021 budget preparation and out years, we're actually using the slow recovery assumptions to build our budget for 2021. We fully intend to bring you a balanced budget. We'll be consistent with our typical goals, financial stability, uh, being able to deliver on our promises to our community. Um, there, there are a number of guiding principles we um, put forward to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic and we'll continue to be consistent with those. So really, um, really two messages to leave you with today. One is sales tax revenue definitely coming in better than we thought and we will continue to watch it. We, um, we have a meeting coming up with the Puget Sound CFOs in a couple of weeks here and that will help us understand kind of what they're doing. That's the first message. The second message is that we really uh, feel very confident with the CARES Act funding that we received, the ability to use some of our funds in our reserves and a few other cost controls that we will be able to come in with a proposed balanced budget for you to review for 2021. I'm going to say just one other thing and then I'll, I'll finish and be able to answer questions. Um, I mentioned at the last board meeting and I'll say it again, each time we bring you proposed um, action items, I want to make sure you understand that we are looking at those with an additional filter. Given the uncertainties with our financial situation, we are looking at each of our projects, proposals, expenditures with that kind of additional filter to say, given these uncertainties, is this the right move to make at this time? Is there anything we need to do to defer, delay, change assumptions about projects? And so want to make sure that you're aware of that as you go through the rest of the agenda today. I'm happy to answer any questions if you, if you have any. Any questions for Director Beardsley? I can't see everybody with this uh, document up, so just go ahead and speak up if you have any questions. Look, could you unshare the screen, please, and get back to a gallon review? Thank you. Perfect. Um, see no questions. Thank you for that report, Director Beardsley. And uh, we will move on then to committee reports. And the first one is mine under executive committee. The executive committee did meet on Thursday, June the 18th. All members were present. Uh, the CEO reported on the status of the agency's response and plans for COVID-19 and provided a CEO report. The committee did agree to cancel the July 16th quarterly uh, board workshop. And our next workshop uh, will be held on October the 22nd. Our next executive committee meeting is scheduled for Thursday, July 16th at 11.30 a.m. And with that, I'll turn it over to Council Member Todd for the Finance Performance and Oversight Committee report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the Finance Performance and Oversight Committee met on thir Thursday, June 18th, and it was attended by Council Member Nering, Chwedi, and I via Zoom. Uh, consent agenda today has items E through K 
representing the May 2020 expenditures and payroll, we recommend approval. On the action agenda today, there are two items. Number one is, is the approval of resolution number 04-20, amending the 457B deferred compensation plan. Chris Beck will be providing a summary of this resolution, amending and superseding resolution 09-87, which provided a voluntary deferred compensation plan for community transit employees. The committee recommends approval of this resolution. And the second item on the action agenda for today is award of RFP 2020-014 website redesign and related services. Brian Belline will provide a short summary on this RFP, which redesigns our website. Cost is $251,750. The committee recommends award of this project as well. Uh, we had a special report, Jerry just gave it. We asked her to give us a special updated report on COVID-19, we appreciate that. And uh, that kind of supersedes the standard report in there. The standard report is in your packet for the May sales tax report. And that was reflecting purchases made through March when things were still ahead for the year or while they were down for the month. And as Jerry reported earlier, things have changed since then. Thankfully, our sales tax is not as bad as we thought it was gonna be, but we no longer are ahead of the 2019 actuals. And the second item is our diesel fuel report. The, the um, Year to date, May 20 through May 2020, community transit paid an average of $1.42 per gallon for diesel fuel compared to the 2020 budgeted amount of $2.25 per gallon. Positive variance of 83 cents per gallon. And with fuel usage down, we have lots of money in our fuel reserve. Our next Finance Performance and Oversight Committee meeting is scheduled for two o'clock on Thursday, July 16th. That's the end of my report, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that. And the final committee report is the Strategic Alignment and Capital Development Committee, Mayor Leonard Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Strategic Alignment and Capital Development Committee meeting was held on Wednesday, June 17th. The meeting was attended by myself, Labor Representative Lance Thornton, Mayor Nicola Smith, Council Member Todd, and County Council Member Stephanie Wright. As previously reviewed with the board, the agency's facility master plan is an important priority to support future growth. Three items for phase one of the plan were forwarded to today's consent agenda for the Casino Road Building Renovation Project. ITB 2020-004 Casino Road Building Renovation is for the construction and renovation of the existing two-story facilities maintenance building for administrative occupancy in early 2022. Five bids were received for this project. Favorite Construction was selected to perform the work at a cost not to exceed $27,505,000 and change. Funds are included in the 2020 board approved budget under project number 2024. Two task orders accompany this major construction and renovation project. Firms were selected from the agency's qualified vendor list. RFQ 2017-079 is a task order for construction management services by KBA Inc. This vendor specializes in construction management with a high level of experience managing large scale vertical construction projects. The contract is for $1,366,500. Funds are included in the board approved 2020 budget under project number 1024. The second task order for this Casino Road Building Renovation Project is RFQ 2017-079 to provide construction administration services performed by OTAC, Inc. for an amount not to exceed $449,964. OTAC, Inc. designed the building project under a previous task order. Funds for this task order reside in project number 1024 in the 2020 board approved budget. Under action items, the committee reviewed and moved RFP 2020-009 paratransit and ADA eligibility service contract to today's regular agenda. Deputy Director June Duvall will brief the board later in this meeting. Our next regular scheduled meeting of the Strategic Alignment and Capital Development Committee is Wednesday, June 15th at 2 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Kelly. That brings us to the consent calendar, a number of items on there. Does anybody wish to pull any of those for further discussion? If not, we'll open the floor for any potential motion. Mr. Chair, Council Member Todd moves the, moves the consent agenda. Second. Second. 
Moved by Council Member Todd and seconded by Council Member Daudry to approve consent agenda. Final discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. And that brings us to our action items. And the first one is the award of RFP 2020-14. Uh, and Mr. Brian, uh, hope I pronounce this right, Valine? Uh Brian Valin, thank you. Valin, thank you, thank you. And go ahead, Brian, this floor is yours. Okay. So in 2019, I proposed a comprehensive digital strategy to the executive team, along with a three-year roadmap. The first phase of the strategy focuses on a website redesign. Our website is the hub of the digital customer experience. It serves more than 2,500 unique customers each and every day. This is 100% more traffic than the website saw when it was last redesigned over 10 years ago. When you think back to 2010, BlackBerry and Palm were among the top 10 smartphones and the iPhone 3GS was all the rage. Today, BlackBerry and Palm aren't even on the radar and iPhone 11 is Apple's latest offering. However, the Community Transit website remains largely unchanged. Our website serves as the foundation for all things digital. It's where all search and social media traffic is directed. It's where customers come to view detailed service alerts. Routes and schedules are consistently among the top three most visited pages, yet our schedules are not adequately optimized for mobile devices, which more than 80% of our customers use to visit the website. To make travel easy for all, we need to make the website easy for everyone to use. After the redesign, the information on our website will be easier to find. It will work seamlessly on a variety of devices. Our website will be more accessible and it will load faster. This website redesign also serves as the foundation for future phases of the digital strategy, which include further enhancing our digital tools and personalizing the customer experience. It's important that the website redesign begin now so we're prepared digitally for the significant changes that are coming to our service in 2024. This is a time when consumer expectations for what they can do online and contact free are increasing. Our website is a vital communication channel, especially in a rapidly changing uh, world. Creating a better website doesn't just improve customers' overall experience, but their safety. When light rail arrives, it will change how customers get from where they are to where they want to be. Virtually all our customers will be impacted and they will turn to the website for vital information. The executive team agreed, approving the strategy and roadmap which led to the creation of an RFP for the website redesign. After forming a cross-functional team and reviewing 14 proposals, we all agreed that Fell Swoop, a user experience design agency headquartered near Seattle's Pioneer Square, was the best choice to design our new website for the not to exceed cost of $251,750. I brought this recommendation to the Finance Committee last month and they unanimously agreed that I should bring it before the board. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, I have a question. Go ahead. Can, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, on the status and everything, it said the RFP included uh, four components and that uh, Felscoop did not meet all four of them, uh, but we felt that they were still the best. So I was just curious, which one of the four components did they not meet? So Felswoop responded to um, two of the four components. They chose not to respond to two others. Um, the first component was related to doing a current state assessment, which is basically the first step to understanding where we stand currently and what changes need to be made to move forward. The second component, which Fell Swoop is um, expert at in this uh, field, is in terms of design, um, user experience design, information architecture. That's where they shine, and that's the component that they um, primarily focused on. The development and search engine optimization components of the website that they chose not to uh, 
submit a proposal for will be handled by our uh, existing digital scrum team. Okay, thank you. Uh, hey, Brian, so with, and that's Tapia, right? That is Tapia Productions, correct. And so is that a separate contract we have with Tapia or are they a subcontractor of, of, um, of, this organ, of, this age, of this business? So Tapia has a current contract um, with Community Transit. I think this will be additional work for them. Um, there may be uh, someone from procurement that would be in a better position to answer that question. Okay. Uh, Mayor Neri, this is Jerry. I can step in to answer that if you'd like. Sure. So uh, if you recall, we have a board resolution that requires us to bring you contracts of value of 150,000 or more. Um, this is a new contract and falls within that, which is why Brian's briefing you on this particular contract and we're seeking board action. We already had a prior contract with, um, with Tapia, which allows us, which we brought to the board earlier, but uh, the resolution allows Emmett as CEO to approve uh, change orders and task orders, and this would be an expansion of the work they're currently doing. Okay. Yeah, so it's kind of weird because they're the same amount, of, almost the same amount of money, but one comes to you, one is uh, processed slightly differently. Okay, thank you. And then the work by Fell Swoop will include a website redesign. Will it also include ongoing maintenance, or is that a monthly fee on top of that, or is that handled some other way? No, it does not include ongoing maintenance. That again will be handled by our uh, internal digital okay. Scrum team. Uh, in collaboration with the Creative Services Department in Marketing, who will be provided a style guide for the new website and will be able to help us maintain the new site going forward. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? If there are none, we'll open the floor for any potential motion on this item. Mr. Chair, I make a, make a motion that the Board of Directors authorize the CEO to negotiate and award RFP 2020-014 website redesign and related services to Bell Swoop in the not to exceed amount of $251,750. Second. Moved by Council Member Todd and seconded by Council Member Schwede to authorize this. All those in, uh, any final discussion, I'm sorry. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Thank, thank you, you for very that. much. Yeah, thank you for the presentation as well. And that brings us on to resolution 4 20, and that goes to Chris Beck. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can hear me just testing my audio really quick. Okay, thank yeah. you. Um, my name is Chris Beck. I work in the employee engagement department here at Community Transit. And thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today um, regarding our 457B retirement and deferred compensation plan. I presented last month to the Finance Performance and Oversight Committee and they have requested that I bring my presentation to you here today. Before I get started, I just wanna spend just a very short period of time um, giving the board an overview with regards to our 457B plan. Um, our plan is much, uh, 457 plan is much like a 401k plan in the private sector. This benefit is voluntary. Employees can use, can put money in it um, through paycheck uh, withdrawal into a retirement account on a post or CMA pre-tax basis. Um, the account is administered by the ICMARC Corporation. The plan assets are owned by the plan participants, not by community transit. Again, the plan is voluntary. Employees can start and stop uh, contributing without restriction. Participants choose the investment options they would like their money um, to be put into. We have 474 participants in the plan, of which 377 are current employees. That 377 is uh, 126 employees that are represented by the IAM, 103 non-represented employees, 98 employees that are represented by the ATU, and that leaves 97 um, former employees that still have money in, in the plan. 
I mentioned our third party administrator is ICMARC. We started using ICMA over 30 years ago when we started the plan. And ICMA is, is mentioned in the original resolution 09-87. While it was probably required um, to have a board resolution naming ICMA in order to start the plan, um, after 30 years, it's time to update this resolution. It's important to note that um, the er in the early years of the 457 plan, we needed to record the plan assets on our financials. However, in 1997, the IRS changed this regulation and this is no longer a requirement. While the funds, do, the funds in the plan do belong to the participant, community transit has a fiduciary obligation to oversee the plan. One area is to ensure the fees that ICMA is charging the plan participants are reasonable. This year, we asked our financial advisement firm to perform an analysis on the plan, and they informed us they no longer did that type of work and made suggestions of a number of firms we could use to have the evaluation done. We've got proposals and quotes and determined that the highest group was the best advisor to work with moving forward. One of the primary reasons why we chose highest was their long list of public sector customers for which they provided the exact same advice we were seeking. Highest reviewed our fees and investments and has determined that we can get better rates. And they suggested best practices for community transit to consider, such as putting our 457 third party administration services out for solicitation in order to receive competitive rates, even from our current provider. So the action item that we are asking you to consider today is resolution 04-20, which amends and supersedes resolution 0987. This resolution, um, shifts the approval of the plan changes from the board of directors over to the CEO, which allows the CEO to make plan changes such as choosing a new 457 TPA after a solici solicitation, if that is indeed what we decide to do, or adopting timely um, plan changes such as allowing um, for uh, the CARES Act changes that I outlined in my cover letter. The CEO would create a committee to establish oversight of the plan. Um, the committee would work with the highest, our group account, account manager, Audrey White, to research and evaluate possible plan changes and then make recommendations to the CEO for his approval. I want to be clear that this isn't this, this committee isn't being formed to establish a whole new way of choosing funds to invest in, much like we have maybe in other areas of finance but rather it's to get improved results for our 457 and add options to the plan that would benefit its participants. There are several ways to set up the approval process. High, uh, the highest group has a number of clients who have decided to have the decision making done at the committee level. Um, Council member Todd requested that I reach out to several uh, local transits to see how they made their 457 plan changes. And just to report back, Inner City and Pierce Transit have their board making all plan changes. Whatcom and Kitsap have their 457 plan administered through the Washington State Department of Retirement Systems Deferred Comp Plan and therefore have absolutely no, no say in specific plan changes. And Spokane Transit has authorized their CEO to make changes. Using the Using the team to conduct the research and make recommendations um, to the CEO is in line with the culture and the structure of decision making within our agency currently. So therefore, this is what we're proposing today. Finally, this resolution provides indemnification provisions for the board, officers, legal counsel, employees, and members of the 457 committee, which was not included in the original um, resolution. Additionally, we are asking for authorization to purchase indemnity insurance as it pertains to the 457 plan, as our current insurances do not have this coverage. This is the end of my pre presentation, and I'm open for any uh, comments or questions. Any questions or comments from the board?
Chris, thank you for that presentation. And we'll open the floor then for any potential motion on resolution 420, council member Todd. Yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, recommend that the board of directors approve resolution 04-20 superseding resolution 09-87. Second. Moved by council member Todd and seconded by Mayor Kelly. And back to council member Todd, did you have a comment? Yeah, I just want to speak to the motion. I thank you, thank staff very much for a, an exhaustive presentation and the question and answer period during our committee meeting. And Chris addressed those issues, those issues very well in her presentation here. I think she summarized it well at the end that uh, the question was, is how are other people doing this? And I suspect that it is a carryover from the past for many agencies. Uh, but indeed, I think our culture at Community Transit and the structure we have and our trust in our CEO and the staff makes it reasonable for us to do this at this point in time. And I, th I also think that we've uncovered this indemnification issue where I think if the board have their, has their fingers too far into it, it's not a good thing. So I think we're moving, making the right move by uh, having this new re resolution supersede the old one. And I uh, would like to encourage other folks to vote yes. Thanks. Thank you for that. Are there any other comments before we vote? All those in favor then? Aye. 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 <laughs> Opposed? Any abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Thanks again, Chris. Uh, the final action item is the award, the uh, proposed award of RFP 2020-009 for paratransit and ADA. And uh, June Duvall, June, go ahead. Good afternoon, board members. This is June Duvall, Deputy Director of Planning and Development. This item was forwarded by the Strategic Alignment and Capital Development Committee. Earlier this year, the decision was made to re-procure the paratransit contract to address some contractual concerns, improve the current technology, and enhance the services provided. Request for Proposals 2020-009 was released on March 9th in a national procurement. On April 20th, we received five proposals. The evaluation committee consisted of subject matter experts from around the agency as well as outside consultants. The top three firms were asked to submit best and final offers, which were then evaluated again and resulted in a short list of the top two firms. Virtual interviews and software demonstrations were done with the top two firms and the top firm identified was TransDev Services Inc. The TransDev proposal reflected a strong management team a sound vehicle maintenance plan, and upgraded technology that will greatly improve our customers' experience. Over the course of the contract period, the TransDev proposal was also lower in cost by $1.6 million. The first five years of the contract amount to $48,700,289. Staff recommends approval of this contract, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. <clears throat> yeah, Thank June. You. Oh. Oh, go ahead, Council Member Shreddy. Okay. Um, I just need some clarification. Uh, I know that Homage has uh, done this, and if I remember correctly, uh, it was nine million and some just short of 10 million that we were giving or giving passing on to Homage to take care of uh, the transportation. So, I'm a little confused on this. Does this mean that they no longer will be doing it and this other company will, or how does that work? That is correct. It would be a new contract mm -hmm. provider for all of our paratransit and ADA eligibility services. Okay, so uh, homage won't be, we won't be providing homage with the 9 million plus each year then. It will go to these. People. That, that is correct. Okay. Is that going to be a concern with senior services? Jean, I, this is it. This is Emmett. I can yeah. tell you that um, that I have had uh, conversations with the chief executive officer at Homage Senior Services. And I think all parties believe that this is a transition to a new provider that is in everyone's best interest. Uh, our relationship with Homage Senior Services remains very strong. And uh, simply uh, time, you know, simply the business process of renewing 
the uh, proposals to provide these services and we had a proposer who was uh, more capable of providing a fuller array of services and we think enhancing the quality of services to our vendors. So I do not expect any issues whatsoever with Amish Senior Services. Oh, good. Thank you very much. That appreciate that. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Councilmember Todd. Well, just a comment. I, I think this is going to be good for our customers. Uh, having seen TransDev at various trade shows over the years, I've always been impressed by this being one of their main lines of business and the tools and techniques and experience they have for providing services are in this day and age are going to be very helpful. I think Homage Senior Services has done a great job for us over the years, but this is not, they've just been a provider in one market. I think the fact that TransDev is in lots of markets across the country is going to bring new innovations and value to our program. So I'm excited about the transition. While it's sad to see the old ones go, it's exciting to see the, the new ones come on. And as Emmett said, I think we've got a good relationship. So it's it's uh, win, win, win all the way around. Thanks. Thank you. Anything final? Okay. Um, and we did have a motion in a second, right? Just, I just want to make sure. Or did we not? Okay. I'll open the floor for any potential motion then on 2020-009. Uh, I move that we approve uh, 2020-09. Second. Moved by Councilmember Daughtry, seconded by Councilmember Schwede. Thank you for that. Any final comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? That motion passes unanimously. Thank you, June. And uh, thank you, staff, for all of the briefings on those items. And uh, CEO Heath, uh, your chair's report. How about I kick that back to you since you're the chair? Oh, thank you. My pleasure. We'll, we'll go to you afterward. My chair's report will be brief. Um, we, do, we have a, a regular board meeting scheduled for August 6th at 3 p.m. And other than that, um, nothing for me to report. So now on to you, CEO Heath. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Nearing. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> uh, I would like to thank and commend uh, our three staff presenters today, uh, Brian Valine, Chris Beck, June Duvall, and their teams. Um, you get a, a relatively brief presentation of, of uh, weeks and weeks and weeks of uh, staff work. And they make it look awfully easy. I can assure you uh, it's not. There's a lot of work done in the background to get to the point of making these recommendations to the board. So uh, thank you, presenters and teams. The rest, uh, I think for the rest of my CEO report, I'll just comment briefly on the status of uh, legislative activities. On the federal front, uh, we had a virtual meeting with Congressman Larson on June 8. Congressman Larson uh, requested the meeting so we can have some conversation about the development of the Federal Invest Act. The Invest Act it would be the successor to the uh, current Transportation Authorization Bill, the FAST Act, Fixing America's Surface Transportation. Um, great conversation with the Congressman. I think he, uh, he understands our business well and was able to be a strong advocate for our interest in the Transportation Infrastructure Committee hearings uh, in working on development of the INVEST Act. Going forward, the Speaker of the House chose to embed the INVEST Act, which is a transportation authorization bill, in a larger uh, House of Representatives infrastructure bill. That infrastructure bill is known as the Moving Forward Act. This is somewhat unusual, but um, what will go forward now is the infrastructure bill called the Moving, uh, Moving Forward Act, and embedded in that will be the normal transportation authorization bill, the INVEST Act. The uh, uh, levels of funding 
in the INVEST Act, where our transportation funding uh, comes from, are substantially increased over prior levels. Um, we, our government relations staff, has thoroughly reviewed provisions of the INVEST Act and moving forward, and we are very much in support of these bills. They'll be moving from the House into a, a conference negotiation with the Senate, uh, as is normally the case. I believe most people would say uh, the goalposts are a long, a long ways apart. And through conference activity, we hope that the House and Senate can uh, reach agreement. Uh, it does not appear at this point, however, that there's any significant opposition to any of the parts of moving forward or invest that are important to us. So we're very hopeful that, uh, that the features that we do like will move forward without significant challenge. At the uh, state level, <clears throat> you may be aware that Initiative uh, I-976, the Tim Iman initiative, has made its way to the, to the Supreme Court. Uh, oral arguments on that case were heard on June 30th. Uh, the court will now make its decision. Uh, the timeline for a decision is uncertain. However, there are a number of justices up for re-election this fall. There's some speculation that uh, that they may choose to uh, wait till after the elections to uh, publish a decision uh, on 976. So no timeline for a decision there, but still moving forward. And that completes my CEO report for today. Happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you. All right. If there are no questions, we'll move on then to board communication and start with Council Member Daughtry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, on July 4th this year, Lake Stevens at 10 o'clock in the morning will be dedicating their new war memorial. If anybody wants to come join us for that, it'll only be about 55 minutes and we'll be done. And there's going to be a small craft and farmer's market at the same time. And you might be able to come down and enjoy the new mill that we've opened up uh, at the same time. It's at the North Cove complex downtown, right next to City Hall. You're all invited to come and uh, dedicate our new war memorial. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, Mayor Kelly? Um, I have nothing. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Gallagher? Uh, nothing this afternoon. Thank you. Councilmember Neary? Nothing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Labor Representative Norton? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have nothing. Thank you. Councilmember Schwedy. Um, <clears throat> been going to a lot of Zoom things, um, but one, um, I'm on the PSRC Transportation Board and haven't been to a meeting since February, but we are meeting next week uh, via Zoom. So uh, there are things that need to be taken care of and it's that's where we are with that. Other than that, we're like everyone else. Thank you. Council Member Todd? No report this today, thank you. Thank you, and uh, Council Member Wright? Nothing to report, thank you. Thank you for that. I believe I got everybody, did I miss anyone? Yeah, Mayor Smith does not oh. have a report. Thank you, appreciate that, Mayor Smith. Okay, um, we do have need of an executive session at this point uh, to review the performance of a public employee. Uh, Emmett, how much time do you think we will need for this? There's no action expected. I would expect 20 minutes and uh, if more is needed, we could uh, extend. Okay. So this we'll is Jenny, can I say something? Uh, yes. Sorry about that. I was trying to introduce myself at the start of the meeting, but unfortunately there, there's been a misunderstanding. I was trying to let all of you know that I was here on official business today. Um, as as, all, as at least most of you know, I have been coming on a regular basis as uh, a person of interest on DART and community transit as just public community, but I'm also here now officially on official business, I, I'm to repeat myself. Um, I am now part of the advocacy committee at, and have been for Washington Council of the Blind. And from here on out, I will be coming to you officially 
as a part of an extension of them because we're, we're trying to reevaluate what we're doing and we're spreading out the work. And since I already know you, I will be here on that basis. Thank you for that. We appreciate it. Yeah. And with that, we will uh, adjourn into an executive session and uh, we'll let our IT folks move us into that room. And then uh, maybe Emmett, you can let me know when we're uh, moved over or somebody from staff and I'll go ahead and start the exec session. And for the rest of the audience, uh, they may be starting to move over, but there's nothing for anyone to do. The back office will move all members who will participate in the executive session to We're back. <laughs> and we made it. We made it, good. Do we have uh, a motion to adjourn this meeting? I move to adjourn the meeting. Second. Moved by Council Member Daughtry, seconded by Council Member Todd. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Meeting adjourned. Have a safe, fun fourth, everybody, and we will see you afterwards. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thank you.